Well, the weird thing about cathode rays is that, first of all, it's taken on its face that it's a vacuum, right? But humans can't really make perfect vacuums. And it turns out that the cathode ray devices or any of these vacuum discharge devices, they don't work at all if they're full of air. You pump them down, they start to actually make this beam of electric action. But then at some point, it breaks down. Like if you get the vacuum too low, you basically can't do it at all at some point. And that's really, really weird because for us, it points to the fact that right. something about the materials, the gases that are getting whatever, whatever's happening to those gases is instrumental in the transmission of this process. And so you have an opportunity for there to be action and actors that aren't part of the fundamental story. And since we talked to you, I actually was looking at this, that when you produce a sufficiently high vacuum, the only way that you can pass charge through a cathode ray tube is through thermionic heating of the cathode, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is that you basically have to heat it to, I think I looked, it was almost a thousand degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. I found a paper that was looking at scanning electron microscope photographs of the cathode before and after thermionic heating. Mm -hmm. And before you have this perfectly smooth surface mm -hmm. and afterwards it's completely degraded. It's these mm -hmm. enormous chasms that are formed, mm -hmm. but there isn't a theory that explains why this destruction of the cathode is necessary in order for the mm -hmm. electrons to escape. Because mm -hmm. if you're shooting little bowling balls, you would expect mm -hmm. that, why, why would you need to destroy the cathode in order exactly. to shoot your bowling ball? <laughs> Excellent question, yes. So why, you know, why does cold emission not work in perfect vacuum, yes? It can't be squared with the electron gun idea that you're just shooting these things across yeah. space. It just doesn't square with it. However you want to cut it, that's an insufficient explanation. I mean, it also gets multiplied when you start looking at current in circuits. Whatever standard model you choose for electricity in a wire, it doesn't just mean electrons flying down the pipe like you're taught in the basic mm -hmm. models. And yeah, so there is no charge transport. Certainly not at the speed of the electricity. Right. Mm, yeah. It's like this is the the Drood model of just the electrons just kind of shuffling along at a snail's pace. And mm. it's the fact that it's the front of the movement that moves at the speed of light while the electrons themselves just kind of bobble around. Mm -hmm. But I was struck by something as I was reading through these early papers, which is that before people like Bohr and Pauli and Dirac and you know Heisenberg and Schrodinger, the, the quantum mechanicists, the mathematicians show up, Physics papers are very much preoccupied with this question of what is electricity. Like, mm -hmm. so there's, um, I was reading the about the Zeeman effect, which is mm -hmm. that uh, you can cause the splitting of spectral lines under a strong enough magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And this was discovered in 1896, I think, by Peter Zeeman, who wanted to see if Faraday was right about this, because Faraday had shown in 1845 that you can actually rotate the polarization of light as it passes through a medium by applying an electromagnet, which is pretty cool. It was the first time that there was any kind of unity between light and electricity, and so it was, very, it was a very dramatic discovery. But he was never able to show that you could affect the wavelength of light. And Zeeman was the one who was like, well, maybe our magnets are strong enough, maybe our detectors are strong enough. And he showed that you actually could. So you could basically take the spectral line of an element out from a Bunsen burner and split it into two. And uh, Hendrik Lorentz was his advisor. And so Zeeman does the experiment, and Lorentz is the one who comes up with a model for how this is happening. Mm -hmm. And it's a deeply physical model. He's like, there is something of the atom that is vibrating and it has a particular orientation in space. And so when you apply the magnetic field, one of the, of the vibrations starts to separate and it's creating these new harmonics and it's affecting the ether. Mm -hmm. But by the time that you get to the quantum mechanicists, everything is abstract. It's all mathematics. It's all matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. And the conversation about what's actually happening to the atom to produce light, what's actually happening to the atom when it's interacting with a magnetic field are completely abandoned. 